So we are a group of mechatronics engineering students at the University of Waterloo here. And um, the problem presented to us was of navigating regular everyday obstacles for people in wheelchairs. Uh, so as you can see, with a normal wheelchair, it'd be difficult to get around on, say, ramps with uh, steps on them or like sidewalks and snow piles and whatnot. So we have a solution for that, and that is uh, right here. Uh, basically a wheelchair attachment um, that you can mount your uh, wheelchair onto, and then you can just ride around in this bad boy, around, anywhere, um, up and down, little porch steps. Uh, you can go through railway crossings, no problem. Sidewalks don't need any assistance that way. Uh, right here, we have this actuator that pushes our seat up, inclines it to your liking. Uh, and it's also adjustable just for comfort, but also it serves the purpose for uh, keeping your center of weight above. And uh, as you can see, if you uh, would like, uh, this actuator uh, provided to us by Progressive Automations. Um, and uh, it's basically able to angle and hold the load of the uh, individual as well as the wheelchair itself. And uh, the main issue now when we were prototyping this uh, is with the high load that it experiences. So we, uh, given the limitations of our budget, we had to purchase one very large track set. And uh, that basically meant we had to redesign everything around that and the connections aren't always the strongest, especially when it comes to the uh, motors with the driving shaft. And long story short, the shafts, they broke a few times. But at the end of the day, they worked too. So uh, we were able to get some footage and it is uh, drivable, it's navigatable, and it in fact covers uh, pretty much most obstacles you want to go over. How's it going? So this is spin stop. What we're doing is we are stopping the spin of hoisted payloads. So if we can see here, there are rescuers that are hoisted by a helicopter. And what often happens is that they spin out of control. This can be due to winds or downwash or other factors. But what we're doing is we're building a device that is put in series between the rescuer and the rest of the cable. And it eliminates all the spin that's seen by the rescuer. I guess one of the main challenges we had was our motor controller. What we're doing inside is we're spinning a large reaction wheel, uh, and this is quite heavy. And we were using a drone ESC, which is typically used to control propellers, which are quite light. So the main challenge we had was to optimize it to spin quite a heavy mass. So before we turn on the system, you can see if I give it a spin, the entire system moves quite easily. Now, if we turn on the system, we'll give it a sec to boot up. And you can see any, any force that I apply to spin the wheel is getting stopped by the system. Hi, we are Team Oscar. Uh, we are making a autonomous overboard rescue robot. This is a surface rescue robot that can drive on the surface of the water. Its use case is for when somebody falls overboard off of like a ship or something at, uh, in a large body of water. People can throw life rings only so far, and once people get beyond that range, it's very difficult to do anything in the me immediate present. Um, for ships like cruise ships and large transport ships, they can take up to like a kilometer to stop, and in that time, people often are out of sight and sometimes are never found again. So where Oscar comes in is when somebody get, like falls overboard, Oscar can be immediately thrown into the water. It will be self-writing, so it will orient itself properly, and then it will go to the last known GPS location of the person when they fell overboard, and then perform a search pattern, looking for their heat signature in the water with a thermal camera, and also making sure that it doesn't pick up birds or other marine life with an optical camera. Once it's found them with the thermal camera, it will drive to them and it is buoyant and they can cling to it and float in the water until rescue comes. And to help rescue find them, Oscar also provides a GPS location to itself and it transmits this over normal radio channels. Uh, so we had a number of challenges. One of the initial ones was making our thermal camera work very well. We found that we needed to waterproof it because this can be deployed in any orientation and almost all of the waterproofing enclosures did not pass through thermal wavelengths. 
So we ended up um, coming up with our own enclosure that has a window we made with a germanium lens that allows thermal wavelengths to pass through. Another issue was uh, supplying the amount of power needed and properly changing the levels to provide power to all the sensors and not blowing them up. And we did have a couple of capacitor explosions, but in the end we came up with our own power distribution board that's been working quite well and causes you know, all of the sensors to work properly. My name is OD. I have with me Refpreet, Simon, and my teammate Colin. So we're a group of fourth year mechatronics students and we basically made a robotic disc launcher. If you've heard of disc golf, it's kind of like regular golf, but you throw a frisbee into a basket rather than a ball into a hole. And the issue we have right now is that the discs that are used, they have different profiles, different geometries, and it's really hard to actually model the flight characteristics of that. So when they want to test it, they give it to athletes and they throw it and they tell you how it feels. You know, it's very qualitative. There's no like actual relevant data to support, you know, whether this shape gives way to this speed or that turn, blah, blah, blah. So what we did was create a robot that could reliably and repeatedly throw discs at certain speeds, at certain spins. And that way you can actually trace it back to get good data for your discs. So now we can give a demo. Um, we have an arm here and it has a custom gripper that holds disks of different geometries. And what we do is we can use Bluetooth <laughs> to spin up the motor on the arm. You can watch through the polycarbonate um, enclosure. And then once we spin up the disk on the arm, we can turn, turn on our machine here. And this goes to like our control panel where we can basically spin the big arm and then we can get it to the right speed to launch the disk. So I'm going to start turning it now. We have a display here where we can read the speed of the arm. Right now it's at about 100 RPM. Can crank it up a bit more. It's at 200 RPM right now. I'll get it up to about 300 and then I'll launch it. So now I'm about to launch. So we have a custom gripper with a solenoid release mechanism to launch it at the same point every time. We've done a bunch of tests in-house and on the field at different RPMs. So here we spun it at 350 RPM and that's about 39.5 kilometers per hour. Um, we also increased the RPM to almost 900 RPM, so 67.8 kilometers per hour. And then we went on the field and were able to do a high-speed test where we launched it. I think when we went to the furthest speed, about 900 RPM, we we're able to go to the length of a football field. So about 330 feet, give or take, which I would say was pretty, pretty impressive. I think it met the targets we wanted. Um, this is us testing it. And you can see we were able to kind of like, we, we, well, we had issues <laughs> looking at the RPM out in the field but we were able to make our way to set the speed and actually get it running so here we have the point where we actually launched it and it flew like right across the field and it was pretty amazing snowmo the uh, portable ice free surfacer so growing up we've all played hockey skating on outdoor rinks and everything and we noticed the uh, the ice quality was never good so we always wanted to fix that. Normally it's maintained by volunteers with a fire hose. As you can imagine, not the most consistent ice rink. So traditional Zamboni solutions cost upwards of $200,000 um, and they weigh multiple tons. Introducing Snowmo, uh, a much more budget friendly, community friendly option. Um, we're targeting um, outdoor uh, rinks, uh, focusing on communities that aren't able to afford these large scale solutions. So we have a shovel on the front and our ice uh, water resurfacing system at the back. Uh, we sh clear the snow in front of us. Uh, we have a camera that autonomously helps us path planning. And then we drop the water behind us at the, at the back and make sure we have a nice, smooth, consistent uh, flood of the ice across. So it helps bring the, uh, the joy of skating to not just uh, 
expensive solutions where you need a multi-thousand dollar rink, multi-thousand dollar arena. Yeah. It's more for the community on a pond, on an outdoor rink and uh, help bring the joy of skating to everyone. My name is Jacob and myself along with uh, Taylor, Ariel and Victoria are uh, Harrowmation. And our project is designing and building an autonomous uh, robot to harrow a horse arena. Generally, this task has been done uh, ma by manual labor, driving a tractor and attaching a harrow attachment to it. And our goal was to add an autonomous, hands-free harrow uh, uh, robot to do this job for us. And so what this does is it uh, horses in a horse arena pat down the dirt and make it all hard. And that's dangerous for them as they can strain a muscle. So the goal of this robot is to harrow the arena, make the sand nice and loose, and it follows a path similar to a Zamboni to uh, achieve this task. One of the hardest challenges was uh, getting the vision system to work. Because this is an autonomous robot, we have to create a vision system to know when it's at a wall and when to start its turning motion. So with that, we use a LiDAR to uh, be able to get uh, the view of the walls and know when it's time to turn. Yeah, so with the mirror below is just so you can see the underneath and get the, uh, so you can see the spikes that come out and they fold out and they can change their different depth depending on the arena because different arenas need different depths of harrowing. Hello, I'm Cameron Charda. Uh, this is our project here where we made a soft robotic arm to solve the issue that people have with lymphedema. Lymphedema is a condition where swelling occurs under the skin between the muscle and the skin layer which can limit mobility, impair movement, causes uh, discomfort and irritable skin. Now in order to actually treat lymphedema which is incurable patients typically go into a clinic and they'll get a massage done where the fluid, the lymphatic fluid that is built up typically in the extremities is removed and pushed slowly in a massage like manner towards lymph nodes that are active and working. Those are typically located in the back. Now given there's about a million people in Canada with this condition, there's a large stress on the healthcare system that results in uh, patients not getting the treatment uh, as often as they need it, which is typically a few times a week. Now our goal, which you can see behind us, was to mimic the motion of a massage so that these could be implemented in hospitals and at home so that patients could receive care around the clock in a safe and efficient manner. And so what we built here was a six degree of freedom robotic arm with a 14 degree of freedom robotic hand. And so this is the hand down here. We tried to mimic the uh, anatomical model of the human hand. So we have our metacarpal, our proximal, our distal. Inside here we also have abductors. The thumb, because it's hard to mimic a saddle joint, that of which humans have, we had to add extra joints for the thumb. So that's not a direct mapping, but it still is a close approximation of the degrees of freedom that a human thumb has. Moving upwards, we have what's called a spherical wrist. This means we have a rotator, a flexor, and another rotator. This allows the hand to be put in any orientation that we choose to, given the degrees of freedom within that. Moving back down the arm, we have one, two big flexors and a big rotator in here. This allows us to put the hand in any position. With those being combined, it allows us to move this hand in any position in this space and in any orientation. With that being said, we can't let it self-intersect, so there is some limitations to that. But given the overall structure of this, we have a wide variety of positions and orientations we can reach so that we can successfully mimic MLD, which is manual lymphatic drainage.